اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ إليكم يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا صدق الله العلي العظيم عطر أفواهكم وزين مجالسكم بذكر الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد Respected elders Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, beginning tonight and over the course of this uh, lecture series, I'd like to spend some time examining the life of our fourth Imam, Al Imam Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam. And the reason why I decided to, to dedicate five lectures to the life and the legacy and the contributions of Imam al-Sajjad is because unfortunately many of us, especially in our communities, even those who attend majalis on a regular basis, we have defined Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam and we have, we have ascribed to him a permanent quality that really only represented a condition that lasted for a few days. When we think about Ali ibn al-Husayn alayhi salam, we refer to him as Marid Karbala, the sickly imam, the imam who was unwell. And we use this description as though this is a permanent quality of the imam. The imam alayhi salam was only sick for a few days. There is so much more to Imam Zainul Abidin salam than an Imam who was too ill to participate in the battle of Karbala. So inshallah, the, the aim and the objective of this, uh, this series, this discussion, is to have a more holistic view of the life of this Imam who lived for 57 years. But unfortunately, we define this imam. We, we characterize him by what he did during those few days after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, after the massacre in Karbala. Now, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, as I said, he lived for 57 years. And most of us only know, we have small little glimpses of his life on the day of Ashura, and perhaps one or two sermons that we're familiar with, and that is really the extent of our knowledge about this Imam. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, he lived 57 years, according to the most accurate historical accounts. He was born in the 38th year after the Hijrah, which means that he lived to see his grandfather, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, because Ali ibn Abi Talib 
was martyred in the 40th year after the Hijrah. So when Amir al-Mu'mineen was martyred, Imam al-Sajjal was two years old. So he actually met his grandfather. He sat in the lap of Ali ibn Abi Talib, of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And he was martyred in the 95th year after the Hijrah. So he's he lived for 57 years. Now, just you know, some basic biographical information. Of course, his father is is one who needs no introduction. His father is Sayyid al-Shuhada, the master of martyrs, the grandson of the Prophet Abi Abdullah al hussein And with respect to his mother, historians mention that his mother was not an Arab. She was originally from Persia. And there are different names that are mentioned in the riwayat, but it seems that she's known as Shahrbanu. And there's a discussion, there's a debate among historians about the, her, the family that she came from. Some say that she was the, the daughter of uh, a Persian king, Yuzdajard. Others say that, no, we have, and by the way, we, we don't really have any concrete evidence that she was the daughter of uh, of the king of Persia. What we know for certain is that she comes from a very noble family in, uh, in Persia. So this was his mother. And inshallah, we'll speak a little bit about, uh, about her and Imam Sajjad's relationship with her uh, in the upcoming uh, nights, uh, sp specifically because she died during uh, child labor. So Imam Sajjad alayhi salam, you know, loses his mother during, um, uh, as she was delivering him. Now, the Imam alayhi salam, we said that he was born in the year 38 after the Hijrah. And we know that Karbala, that the Imam al Hussein alayhi salam was martyred in the year 61 after the Hijrah. So just to put this in perspective, we know that just from these dates that Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, he was 23 years old on the day of Ashura. He was a 23-year-old on that day. Now, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, when you look at the riwayat, when you look at the, the historical accounts about his life, you find that he, he had many honorific titles. You know, among the children of Imam al Hussein, he was, you know, the children of Imam al Hussein are, are all unique, very holy personalities, even his daughters. But Imam al Sajjad, -salam, Imam Ali ibn al Hussein, shone like, he shined like a star among them. You know, if the children of Imam al Hussein were stars, then Imam al Sajjad was like the moon in his luminosity. So even with Imam al Hussein, even when even though he had a son like Ali al Akbar, who's Ashbah al Nas, Khalqan wa Khulqan wa Mantiqan bi Rasulillah, that Ali 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 al Akbar had these noble qualities. Ali al Akbar is a very, very prominent, a very holy personality. Yet Imam al Sajjad is uh, is superior. He there was there was he his degree of spirituality was was far higher after all he's one of the masumin imam al-sajjad is known by many honorific titles and there's a long list he's known as you know imam al-muttaqin sayyid al-abidin but among he's known as the thafanat because of the the impressions that would be left on his his palms from his lengthy sajdas there would be calluses and dead skin that he would scrape off because of how much time he spent in sujood. So he has many titles, but among the Al-Qab, among the titles of Imam, Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein, there are two of them that are the most prominent and the most well-known. And that is his title of Zain al-Abideen, which means the ornament of worshippers, and as sajjad So among all of the honorific titles of of this Imam, these are the two most well known and the most prominent. Now, why was why was he called Zainul Abidin? And who gave him this, this title 
of being Zain al Abidin. And the word Zain means the beautification of something, the ornamentation. So if you think of, for example, a wedding, you know, when there's a wedding, you know, all of the women are dressed very nicely, their beauty stands out. But there is one individual on a wedding day who who is unique, meaning their beauty, they are the focal point, and that is the bride. So the idea of Zainul Abidin is that all worshippers of Allah, they possess a type of zina, they possess a type of beauty. But among the worshippers of Allah, there is one who has a very distinct beauty, who is the focal point of beauty, and that is Imam Ali ibn Hussein, Zainul Abidin. Now, where does this title come from? It seems from narrations that, that the Prophet ﷺ mentions this title. He mentions this title for Imam al-Sajjad, Imam Ali ibn Hussein. And in fact, we have a narration that is recorded by Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir, by the way, is, is a Sunni historian, and he's a mufassir, and he's a scholar of hadith. He has a book, a very well-known book, by the name of Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, which literally means the beginning and the end. In this book, Ibn Kathir, he reports a narration from Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. Jabir ibn Abdullah should be an, an, a name that is very well-known to us, the very well-known, uh, notable companion of the Prophet. So Jabir ibn Abdullah reports this narration. He says, Kuntu jalisan inda Rasulillah wal Husaynu fi hijre wa huwa yula'ibu. Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, he says, one day I was sitting with the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and Hussein was in the lap of the Prophet. So Imam al-Husayn was a toddler at the time. Wa huwa yula'ibu. Jabir says that the Prophet, you know, Hussein was not just sitting in his lap. The Prophet was playing with him. So, I'm, so, so try to picture this in your mind. Imagine the scene. Jabir ibn Abdullah is sitting with the Prophet. The Prophet has Imam al Hussein in his lap, who's a toddler, and he's playing with him. He's tickling him. He's kissing him. Faqala ya Jabir. The Prophet turns to Jabir. Faqala ya Jabir. يولد له مولود اسمه علي أو جابر This Hussein that is in my lap One day he will have a son This Hussein will have a son Whose name is Ali إذا كان يوم القيامة نادى مناد ليقم سيد العابدين On the day of judgment a caller will call out, let the master of worshippers, and some, some narrations mention, let the ornament of worshippers stand or come forward. So you see that the Prophet ﷺ mentions that on the day of judgment, Imam Zain al Abidin, a caller will call out when it is the time for his reckoning or if the time for him to bear witness for certain things, a caller will call out, let the master of worshippers or let the ornament of worshippers rise up or come forward. And then the Prophet says to Jabir, Muhammad. And this Ali, the son of Hussein, will also have a son whose name is Muhammad. And then the Prophet says, فَإِنْ أَنْتَ أَدْرَكْتُهُ يَا جَابِرْ فَقَرَأْهُ مِنِّ السَّلَامِ And this Muhammad, who is the son of Imam al-Sajjad, Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn, his name is Muhammad, O Jabir. If you ever get the chance to see him, to see Muhammad ibn Ali, convey my salam to him. So this is one narration that shows, that indicates, and this is from a Sunni source, that... Sayyid al-Abideen or Zain al-Abideen was a title that the Prophet gave, the Prophet ascribed to Ali ibn al-Husayn So he's known as Zain al-Abideen. 
He's also known as a sajjad a sajjad meaning the one who who regularly who abundantly prostrates there is a, a narration from imam al baqar alayhi salam where he he speaks about this this habit of his father so imam al baqar is speaking about imam zain al abidin he says and this is something that you and i should try to practice as much as we can Imam al-Baqir in describing the habit of sujood of his father, he would say, Ma dhakara lillahi ni'matan alayhi illa wa sajjad. That whenever Imam al-Sajjad would remember a blessing of Allah or a certain ni'mah, a certain bounty, a certain divine favor was brought to his attention, illa wa sajjad. The Imam would go down into Sajda. This is a good. This is a good habit for us to develop, brothers and sisters. You know, we remember that, for example, that we're healthy. Instead of just saying Alhamdulillah, go down and do a sajda of gratitude, sajda to shukr. You got a promotion at work. You know, don't just jump up and down. Go down and perform a sajda. This is a very good habit. It's highly recommended to offer a sajda of gratitude. So this is what Imam Al Baqir says, and then he continues. وَلَا دَفَعَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ سُوءًا إِلَّا وَسَجَدْ When the Imam used to remember a blessing, he would prostrate. When the Imam, whenever Allah would repel a calamity or a hardship from him, he would go down into sujood. You know, sometimes, you know, we're driving and God forbid we almost get into an accident or there was a problem that was resolved. There was an illness that we were cured from, we recovered from. Imam al-Baqir says, whenever Allah would repel a calamity, the Imam would go in and he would do a sajda of shukr. He would go down into sujood and say, a shukru lillah. So when he would remember a ni'mah, when Allah would repel a hardship from him, he would go down into sujood. So you see that Imam Zain al would would not only go down into sujood when he's praying, you know, you and I, Unfortunately, the only time where when we do sajda is when we're praying. But you see that sujood is something that is done throughout the day. You know, whenever you think of something that Allah has given you, that Allah has protected you from harm, it literally takes a few seconds. Go down, find something that you can do sujood on. You don't even need to be in a state of tahara. You don't even need to be facing qibla. Go down into sujood and that's it. You receive that thawab. وَلَا فَرِغَ مِنْ صَلَاةٍ مَفْرُوضَةٍ إِلَّا وَسَجَدٍ And the Imam السلام, whenever he would finish his daily prayers, he finishes Salatul Fajr. After he finishes, he goes down, he does a sajda of shukr, prostration of gratitude. Salatul Dhuhr, same thing, Salatul Asr. So one small action that we can incorporate into our daily routine is to develop this culture of sajda of gratitude prostrations of gratitude and this is what we can do in our own way to try to follow in the footsteps of our fourth imam salawatullahi alayhi and then the imam alayhi salam imam al-baqar at the end of the hadith he says wa kana athar sujood fi jami'i mawadi'i sujood you know when we go down into sajda there are seven parts of our body that touch the earth. Our forehead, our palms, our knees, and the tips of our toes. Imam al-Baqir he says that Imam al-Sajjad used to perform sujood for long durations. Now I'm not saying that this is something that you and I need to do, but it just goes to show you how important sujood is. We achieve maximum nearness to Allah when we're in this, this state of utter submission and humility before Allah. Imam al baqir says every part of his body that would touch the ground, all of the parts of the body that participate in sujood, you could see that there were marks on them. When you look at his hands, you could tell this is the hands of someone whose hands were always pressing on the earth. His forehead, there's the mark of sujood. His knees, his toes. And therefore, he was known as a sajjad, 
Sajid means the one who prostrates. Sajjad is the one who frequently prostrates. So this is with respect to the two most well-known titles of Ali ibn Hussein. Zainul Abidin, based on the riwayah that we mentioned from Jabir, about, uh, where the Prophet speaks about the Day of Judgment and how he's, he's going to be recognized as the master, Sayyid al-Abidin or Zainul Abidin. And then we have this narration from Imam al-Baqir about the, the laqab of al-Sajjad. Now, when historians look at the life of Imam Ali ibn al-Husayn, they divide his life into two, two main phases. The first phase of his life is from birth to age 23. Because on the day of Ashura, at the age of 23, Imam Zain al-Abidin becomes the Qa'im. He becomes the active Imam. He assumes the active role of Imam. Prior to that, Imam Zain al-Abidin is subservient to the Imam of Imam al Hussein or Imam al-Hassan, or Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. So the first phase of his life is from birth to 23, the age of 23. And then the second phase of his life, which is the beginning of his imama, they look at it from the age of 23 to the age of 57. And the period of his imama was 34 years. Now, with respect to... The first phase of his life, his birth, his childhood, his adolescence. Unfortunately, we don't have that much information about the details of his life between birth and the age of 23. What we know, of course, is that just like all of the other imams, they played a supporting role, meaning that the imam, السلام, so when Amir al-Mu'mineen was martyred, Imam al-Sajjad was two years old. When his uncle, Imam al-Mujtaba, was mart when he was martyred, when he was poisoned, in the year 50 after the Hijrah, Imam al-Sajjad was 12 years old when Imam al-Hassan was poisoned. So, of course, he's a, he's a young man. He's a child. He's, he's probably below the age of, of Bulugh. But nonetheless, he plays a supporting role to his, uh, to his uncle. Now, from the age of 12 to 23, of course, he's in Medina with his father. Imam Zainul Abidin, السلام, if you look at his, his childhood and his adolescence, he was born the year or close to the year when the Battle of Safin took place. So he opened his eyes into a world that was full of aggression towards the family of the Prophet. Amir al-Mu'mineen is fighting his enemies in the battlefield. His grandfather is struck by one of the Khawarij, Ibn Muljin. He sees 10 years of persecution of the Shias under Imam al-Mujtaba. He sees the treachery and the deceit and the manipulation of Muawiyah. He sees the suffering of many of the Shias during, uh, during the lifetime of his, uh, his uncle and his father. And, of course, he's with his father, Imam al-Hussein, in, in Medina. And, of course, he travels with his father, Imam al-Hussein, to Mecca, where they stay for, for a few months. They receive the letters from Kufa. So Imam al-Sajjad is there every step of the way as essentially the right-hand man of his, of his father, Imam al Hussein. Now, Imam al Hussein السلام, he gave a clear indication that Imam al-Sajjad would be the Imam after him in Medina, even before he left for, for Mecca. Now, one thing that's important for us to know is that, you know, you and I today, as Shia Ithna Ashariya, as 12 or Shias, to you and I, it's obvious who the, who the 12 Imams are. We know their names, but you have to keep in mind that at the time of Imam al Hussein, at the time of the other Imams, of course, there was no, there was no media. It, many of the Shias were not aware 
of the identity of the imam that would come. They would wait to receive certain signs. There are Shias living in other parts of the world. They know that there are 12 imams, but oftentimes you see that there's a bit of a challenge to determine and identify who is the imam after a certain imam. And that's why you have, you know, these divisions that we see. You have, you know, Kaysaniya, you have Zaydiya, you have Ismailiya, you have Waqifiya. So you have other groups because there was confusion about, in some cases, regarding who the imam was. Because of the, the pressure from the government, because of the fear, the imams were not able to publicly announce these things in the way that the Prophet did on the day of Ghadir. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he, he leaves a clear indication in Medina who his successor would be. Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, there's a riwayah from Imam al Sadiq, a tradition where he says, in al, and this is mentioned in Al Kafi. إن الحسين لما صار إلى العراق when Imam al Hussein had intended to go to Iraq استودع أم سلمة رضي الله عنها الكتب والوصية Imam al Hussein عليه السلام he leaves some books that Imam al Hussein inherited from his father Amir al Mu'minin from his brother Imam al Hassan and Imam Amir al Mu'minin he had some books and he had a will that he left as an amana, as a trust with Umm Salama, the wife of the Prophet. When Imam al-Sajjad returned to Medina, Umm Salama transferred this amana. She transferred this trust, these books, and the wills and the testaments of Imam al-Hussein to Ali ibn al-Hussein. So she became a witness. In case there's any confusion, Umm Salama, who is reliable, who's the wife of the Prophet, can attest that Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam left a wasiya, he left certain relics, certain books for Ali ibn al-Hussein. So he made it clear from Medina. So you see that the Imams always try to ensure in the to the best of their ability that the people know, that the Shias know who is the Hujjah of Allah after. Now, there's another narration from Imam al-Baqir salam, where Imam al-Baqir salam he says, so Imam al-Hussein salam gave, us, gave an indication who his wasi would be in Medina, by transferring that amana to Umm Salama to later on give it to Ali ibn al-Hussein. On the day of Ashura, Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, in addition to announcing to his family members in the tents who, who the Imam would be after, Imam al-Baqir, he says, إِنَّ الْحُسَيْنِ إِنَّ الْحُسَيْنِ ibn Ali لَمَّا حَضَرَهُ الَّذِي حَضَرَ When Imam al-Hussein was preparing to get martyred when he was in his final hours, his final moments. He called upon his, the narration says his eldest daughter, Fatima, Fatima al-Kubra, bint al-Hussein, Fatima, the, the daughter of Imam al-Hussein. What does Imam al-Hussein do? فَدَفَعَ إِلَيْهَا كِتَابًا مَلْفُوفًا وَوَصِيَّةً ظَاهِرًا he gives her a special book and a testament, a wasiyah. Why does he give it to her? Because Imam Zayn al-Abidin was sick, he was ill, he was going in and out of consciousness. So he gives this another amana. He gave one to Umm Salama and another he's giving to his eldest daughter. وَكَانَ عَلِيُّ بْنُ الْحُسَيْنِ مَبْطُونًا مَعَهُمْ لَا يَرَوْنَ إِلَّا أَنَّهُ لِمَا Imam. Ali ibn al-Hussein was in the tent, he was ill. فَدَّفَعَتْ فَاطِمَةُ الْكِتَابِ إِلَىٰ عَلِيٍ Fatima, the daughter of Imam al-Hussein, she gives this book, she gives this testament to Ali ibn al-Hussein when he's able to receive it. And then Imam al-Baqir, who's narrating this hadith, 
He says, ثُمَّ صَارَ وَاللَّهُ ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ إِلَيْنَا Imam Al-Baqir, he says, that book that Imam Al-Hussein gave to his eldest daughter, who gave to Imam Al-Sajjad, Imam Al-Baqir says, that book has reached us. It is with us. So the narrator of the hadith, he asks Imam Al-Baqir, قُلْتُ مَا فِي ذَلِكِ الْكِتَابِ جَعَلَنِ اللَّهُ فِي ذَاكِ O Imam, O Imam Al-Baqir, the narrator is now asking, what is that book that Imam al Hussein gave to his eldest daughter to give to Imam al-Sajjad on the day of Ashura? Imam al-Baqir, he says, قَالَ فِيهِ وَاللَّهِ مَا يَحْتَاجُ إِلَيْهِ وُلْدُ آدَمْ مُنذُ خَلَقَ اللَّهُ آدَمْ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَفْنِيَ الدُّنْيَا Imam al-Baqir, he says, I swear by God, that within that book is everything that human beings need from the time of Adam until this world perishes. Everything is in it. So it seems to be an, a commentary on what is mentioned in the Quran. So the Quran gives general principles. So the particulars, many of the details that are not mentioned in the Quran are mentioned in this book. And then he says, in فِيهِ hudud." It is so detailed that even the fixed punishments for certain crimes are mentioned in that book. What, what, what should be the had, the penalty for certain crimes? حَتَّى أَنَّ فِيهِ أَرْشَ الْخَجْ Imam al-Baqir, he says, this book is so detailed that it even mentions the compensation someone has to pay if they scratch another person's face. Just even for a scratch, the the arsh, the compensation is mentioned in that book. So you see that this legacy of knowledge that the Prophet gave, you know, Alamani The Prophet taught me one thousand doors of knowledge. Each door opens up a thousand more doors. That legacy of knowledge did not die with the Prophet, nor did it die with Ali ibn Abi Talib. It was transferred to Imam al Hassan, to Imam al Hussein. And it reaches Imam as sajjad alayhi salam. Now, since time is limited, we'll try to move a little bit quicker. We know what happened on the day of, uh, of Ashura. After the march of Imam al-Hussein, the bodies were trampled, the heads were decapitated, they were put on spears. The women and the children are taken as captives. And they're taken from Karbala to Kufa, which in and of itself is not a very, it's not an easy journey, especially in, under those conditions. Now, when the caravan reached, you know, we always speak about Sham straight away, but there was a lot of suffering, a lot of agony that the Ahlul Bayt experienced in Kufa. When the caravan reached Kufa, Ibn Ziyad, he notices because you keep in mind that Ibn Ziyad is given, he's giving orders to Umar ibn Sa'd to trample the bodies, to bring the heads. Ibn Ziyad ordered that all the men should be killed. So now in his palace, in the Grand Mosque, in the palace of Ibn Ziyad, he sees that. There's a 23, there's a there's a young man who's still alive. He was expecting heads and women and children, and maybe a couple of toddlers here and there. But why does he see a, a fully grown man, 23 years old? So he says, Who are you? He points at Ali ibn Hussein, he says, Who are you? Imam al Sajjad, he says, Ana Ali ibn al Hussein. I am Ali, son of Hussein. Ibn Ziyad, what does he say? أَلَيْسَ قَدْ قَتَلَ اللَّهُ عَلِي ibn al Hussein. Didn't God kill and destroy Ali ibn al Hussein? Now look at, look at how he tries to manipulate the minds of the people. That everything is predestined by Allah and if, if someone is killed, it means that God wanted them to be killed. This is where you see the seeds of predestination being planted in the hearts and the minds of people. 
as a justification for what they did. In any case, Imam al-Sajjad, he says, he responds, قَدْ كَانَ لِي أَخٌ يُسَمَّ عَلِيًّا قَتَلَهُ النَّاسِ Imam al-Sajjad, he said, I had a brother named Ali ibn al-Husayn, meaning Ali ibn al-Akbar, and people killed him. Ibn Ziyad said, God killed him. Imam al-Sajjad says, no, people killed him. Allah doesn't kill. Ibn Ziyad, he becomes angry. Ibn Ziyad says, no, God killed him. Imam al-Sajjad, he quotes a verse from the Quran. Allahu yatawaffal anfusahina mutya. Allah causes the souls to leave the bodies. Allah doesn't kill. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't kill. Allah decrees whether the ruh will remain in the body or it will leave the body. Yes, that is in Allah's hands. But the act of killing is, ascri is ascribed to people. Ibn Ziyad, of course, these people, they don't know the language of dialogue or discussion. Anyone who challenges their authority straight away, they are given orders to kill. Ibn Ziyad, he looks at his guards, he says, He says to them, cut his head off. Can you imagine how ruthless these people are? Ibn Ziyad says, cut, the head, cut, cut his head off. Here say the Zainab السلام, again, she comes forward to protect her nephew. And not just because it's her nephew, because he's the Imam of the time. Imam Zain al Abidin, he tries to silence his, his aunt Zainab. He says, Uskuti Amma. Oh, my aunt, stay quiet for a moment. Let me speak to Ibn Ziyad. Hatta so Ibn Ziyad is threatening Imam al Sajjad with death. But execute him. Imam al Sajjad, and this is where sometimes we forget you know, when we think about courage and strength and valor, we think of Imam al Hussein, we think of Abu al Fadl al Abbas. But Imam al-Sajjad is the most courageous. We cannot even say that we can't even say that Abbas is more courageous than Imam al-Sajjad. Imam al-Sajjad is masoom. He possesses all of these attributes of perfection, human perfection. Imam al-Sajjad, he says to Ibn Ziyad, Abil Qatli, to Hadiduni, Ibn Ziyad, are you trying to threaten me with death? Don't you know who you're talking to? Don't you know that death is a custom in our family? It's a tradition in our family to be, to be killed. And Allah has honored us, Ahlul Bayt, with martyrdom. So you see that Ibn Ziyad, uh, Imam Zain al Abidin, he's not this meek, sickly person who's passive and who's being verbally abused and he doesn't respond. He says, oh, Are you trying to threaten me with death? I have no fear of death. So Ibn Ziyad, he, he sends Imam Zain al Abidin, and there, by the way, there's a very painful moment here. Ibn Ziyad, he parades the family of the Prophet in the streets of Kufa. And the heads are being, being paraded. Now, many of the women and the children who are with Imam Zain al-Abidin and with Sayyidah Zainab, they were the wives of some of the companions who were martyred. And some of those women were Ansar. They come from well-known tribes from the Ansar. Some of the tribes came to Ibn Ziyad and they said that these women, they are from our tribes. We don't allow you to denigrate them. It's not right. So let us take our women back to our tribes. Ibn Ziyad allows them. So as the women and the children are standing in the middle of the marketplace, can you imagine how he tries to humiliate them? Imagine now, you, imagine you're arrested and you're, in the, you're standing in the middle of a mall and people are walking by and they're looking at you and they're laughing at you. And imagine they, and this is not all that happens to the Ahlul Bayt. People start throwing stones at them. One narration says that in front of Sayyidah Zainab, 
There was a woman who came and she took a stone and she threw it at the face of Imam al Hussein that was on the spear. This is what Ahlul Bayt endured. So each tribe, they come and they claim their women. And all of the women are taken. And the only women and children that remain are who? The daughters of Rasulullah. No one comes to claim them and say, this is the family of the Prophet. We cannot have them in the middle of the marketplace exposed and being harassed. And therefore you see that some of the poets, they say that how difficult that moment was for Imam Zain al-Abidin. He's in ropes and chains. The daughters of Imam al Hussein are in ropes and chains. And they say that Imam al Sajjad was so hurt that he did not even look into the eyes of Sayyidah Zainab. What can he say? What can he do? And it says that he, he glanced at Sayyidah Zainab for a moment, a small glance to see the face, what is going on on the face of Sayyidah Zainab. He says, I, he looks. And he sees Sayyidah Zainab looking from right to left. All of the other women, the heads of their tribes came to claim them, to take them to their homes, to take them out of the public eye. But the daughters of Ali, the daughters of Rasulullah, the daughters of Imam Hussein, they're left there. So they're taken to the, the marketplace. The heads are paraded. Now, Ibn Ziyad, he sends a letter to Yazid that Hussein has been killed and the heads are with me now in Kufa. Yazid orders Ibn Ziyad to send the caravan with the heads to Sham because he wants to also celebrate this victory. In Kufa, they put chains around Imam al-Sajjad. Shackles and chains around his neck, around his feet, around his hands. And now the caravan moves from Kufa to Sham. And this is where it's a very long journey. Imagine many of the, the daughters of Imam al-Hussein, they're walking on foot. They're being hit, they're being abused. And Imam al-Sajjad, imagine he's in chains, some narrations say for 40 days. For weeks, he's in shackles and chains. Now, when they arrive in Sham, you have to understand, brothers and sisters, that the people of Sham, they never met the Prophet. The only Islam that they knew was the Islam of the Umayyads. Muawiyah is there and other members of Bani Umayyah are there. So the only Islam that the Sham is familiar with is the Islam that Bani Umayyah taught them. And there were very few Sahaba that lived in Sham. So they did not have exposure to the Prophet, to his Ahlul Bayt, or to even some of the distinguished companions of the Prophet. They were taught the Islam of Bani Umayyah. Now, when they arrive, when the caravan arrives in Sham, one narration says that an elderly Syrian man, he comes, he approaches this caravan. He approaches Imam Zainul Abidin. And look at what he says to him. قال الحمد لله. Look at how brainwashed these people are. They're victims of propaganda. And even today you see people, they're victims of propaganda. They don't know better. They've been manipulated. He says to Imam al-Sajjad, Alhamdulillah al-Ladhi ahlakakum wa amkan al-amira minkum. Praise be to Allah, the one who has destroyed you and who has given victory to the Amir, to our leader, Yazid ibn Mu'aw. Imam al-Sajjad, brothers and sisters, what does he do here? Can you imagine? Put yourself in the shoes of Imam al-Sajjad. You witnessed the slaughtering of your father, your uncle, your cousins, your companions. Your women and children 
have suffered immensely. You've traveled this long journey. You are physically exhausted, mentally exhausted, emotionally exhausted. And someone comes and, th and throws salt on the wound and is saying, I praise, thank God that Allah destroyed you people. What does the Imam do? This is where you see the incredible forbearance of the Imam. Believe me, brothers and sisters, no one else could respond to this man the way that Imam al-Sajjad did. Only a ma'soom would be able to respond with so much compassion, with so much kindness, to have the presence of mind, to maintain your composure. He says, Ya Shaykh, aqara'ta al-Qur'an. This man is cursing Imam al-Sajjad. He's cursing the family of the Prophet. And Imam al-Sajjad still addresses him with adab. With respect, he's an elderly man. He says, Ya Shaykh. He doesn't say, Oh, enemy of Allah. Ya Adu Allah. Ya Shaykh. Oh, elderly man. Al -Quran. Have you ever read the Quran? The man says, Yes. What, what do you have to do with the Quran? Of course, I've read the Quran. Ya Shaykh, have you read the ayah, the verse in the Quran where Allah, where Allah says, Qurba." Where Allah instructs the Prophet to tell the people that I ask no reward from you except mawadda, kindness towards my family. The man said, Yes, I've read that verse. He says to him, Nahnu al Qurba, ya Shaykh. O Shaykh, we are that family of the Prophet. Have you not read another verse where Allah says, where Allah addresses the Prophet saying to him, and give your nearest of kin their due right? A reference to Fadak. He says, yes, I've read that. Imam Sajjad says, ya Shaykh. We are the family of the Prophet. Ya Shaykh, have you read the verse from the Quran that speaks about khums, the way that khums is to be divided, given to Allah, the Messenger, and the family. He says, Yes. We are the family, we are the nearest of kin that is mentioned in this verse. Ya Shaykh, have you read the verse? Where Allah says, "Inna yuridu Allahu liyudhib ankum al-ritz ahl al-bayt wa yutahirakum tatahira." Have you read the verse of purification, where Allah says, "Verily, Allah wishes to, inna yuridu Allah wishes to remove all impurity from you, O household of the Prophet, and to purify you thoroughly." He says, "Yes." Imam al-Sajjad he says, "Nahnu ah, nahnu ahl al-bayt. We are." Ahlul Bayt, we are the family of the Prophet. That we are the ones who are mentioned in the verse of purification. The man, he's looking at Imam al Sajjad, he says to him, Billahi innakum hum, are you really the family of the Prophet? Imam al Sajjad, he says, Tallahi inna la nahnuhum. Imam al-Sajjad, he says, we are the family of the Prophet. Without a shadow of doubt, I swear by my grandfather, Rasulullah, that we are the Ahlul Bayt. Imam al-Sajjad, with a few verses of the Quran, and with adab and with akhlaq, he completely undo, he, he undoes decades of propaganda. The Imam السلام, is able to counter decades of propaganda just from one interaction. Because when the Imam recites verses of the Quran, it's not like an average person reciting verses of the Quran. These are verses that emanate from his heart, from his entire being. It's a very different experience when Al Quran al Natiq is reciting Al Quran al Samit. It's a different experience when the speaking Quran is reciting the silent Quran. It penetrates deep into the heart of this man.
He says, you are the family of the Prophet. He then raises his hands in dua, Allahumma inni abra'u ilayka min aduwi ali Muhammad. That, oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from the enemies of Al Muhammad. On another occasion, a man comes to Imam al Sajjad and says, Ya Ali, O oh Ali, who is victorious? Yazid destroyed you in Karbala. Who is victorious? Who won the war? Imam al Sajjad, what does he say? He says to this man who was taunting him, saying that you were defeated and you've been. You've been vanquished and Yazid is victorious. Imam al-Sajjad says, إِذَا أَرَدْتَ أَنْ تَعْلَمَ مَنْ غَلَبْ If you want to know who was really victorious, وَدَخَلَ وَقْتُ الصَّلَاةِ فَأَذِّنْ ثُمَّ أَقِمْ If you want to know who is truly victorious, when it is the time of salah, recite adhan and recite iqama. And let's see, Whose grandfather is mentioned in the Adhan? Is it the grandfather of Yazid or my grandfather, Rasulullah? That you will never erase the name of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And as long as the name of Muhammad lives on and continues, his Ahlul Bayt will always be attached to him. This was Imam Zain al Abidin during those difficult weeks after. Karbala. And you find that when they when they reach Sham, just like Ibn Ziyad, he put them in a small shack. Yazid Ra'anahullah, he did the same thing. He would not even allow the family of the Prophet to have decent accommodations. He put them in these this these ruins, some run-down abandoned facility. And Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, she took her responsibility very seriously. Imam al Hussein told her that, look after the orphans after me. And Sayyidah Zainab and Imam al Sajjad, their number one priority was to make sure that these children were protected from harm, to make sure that they were being fed, to make sure that they rested, that they were protected. On that one night when they were in this dungeon, in Sham, Sayyidah Zainab, she's able to put all of the children asleep. Imagine that dark dungeon, the family of the Prophet. All of these little children, they're sleeping. There is a few moments of silence. Sayyidah Zainab is there. Imam al-Sajjad is there. They're still awake. They're watching over the the women and the children. But there is one child that wakes up in the middle of the night. The three-year-old daughter of Abi Abdullah. Have you ever seen a three-year-old that is attached to her father? She wakes up and she says, Ya Ammati, O oh my aunt Zainab, Uridu walidi. I want my father. Where is he? It's been... A long time since I've seen him. She insists, say the Zainab says that your father is on a journey. He's away now. But this three-year-old insists. If you've ever seen a three-year-old, you know that when they want something, they insist. They won't let it go. So she demands and she insists on seeing her father, Imam al Hussein. And all of the children, they wake up. And when they see this three-year-old pleading to see her father, everyone starts to cry. How could you not cry when you see this beautiful, pure, innocent daughter of Imam al Hussein salam begging? She wants nothing but to see her father. It broke everyone's heart. But Yazid, in his bedchamber, he hears the crying and the wailing. He calls upon his guards. He says, what is this commotion? What is all of this noise? They say to him that one of the daughters of Hussein is asking for her father. And she is crying. He says she wants to see her father. Give her what she wants. Go, take the severed head of her father and present it to her. So this guard, Allahu Akbar, he takes the 
the head of Imam al Hussein. He puts it on a tray and he covers it with a sheet. He takes it. He walks out of the palace of Yazid all the way down and they go to this dungeon, this ruins that they were in. He enters the small room. Imagine all of them, Imam Zain al-Abideen, Imam al-Sajjad, the women, they're all huddled in the small room. There's barely any room to sit. The guard puts the tray on the ground. The daughter of Imam al Hussein, she says that I didn't ask for food. Why are they bringing food for me? I want my father. The guard says, no, this is what you were asking. So this three-year-old child, she was sitting, she stood up. And she walked, she slowly, cautiously walked to this tray that was covered. And then as she gets close to it, thinking that it's food or it's something, she removes the cover and she sees the severed head of her beloved father, Imam al Hussein. She throws herself on the head. She starts to hug the head of her father. And she starts to cry. She addresses the head of her father. Oh, my father, who is the one that has stained your beard red? That you never had a beard that was red. Why is your beard red now? Oh, my father, who is the one who separated your head from your body? I see your head with me. Oh, my father, where is your body? Oh, my father, who is the one who made me an orphan at this age? She cries and she cries and she weeps until the crying stops. Everyone, they were crying with her. When they saw that the daughter of Imam al Hussein fell silent, they thought maybe she fell asleep. Maybe she was so emotionally exhausted that she fainted for a moment, that she went into a slumber. That's what everyone thought until Imam Zainul Abideen he says, Remove the body of my sister from my father, for her soul has left her body. Now they have a three-year-old, daughter of Imam al Hussein who has died. Allahu Akbar. In these conditions, now they have to prepare the janazah of this baby. Can you imagine the heart of Sayyidah Zainab? How many tribulations can a human heart endure? So... They prepare her body. They wash her body. Say the Zainab is assisted by a lady who's washing the body of this child. And the lady is too afraid to touch the body. She says to say the Zainab, Sayyidati, did this child have an illness? Did this child have a disease? Do you know why she asked that? She says, what are all of these marks and bruises on the body of this child? They say to her that this child from Karbala to Kufa, from Kufa to Sham, whenever she would ask for her father Hussein, they would hit her and they would beat her. La hawla wa la.
والمتقين. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal with these tears, with our tearful eyes, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless us, to forgive us, to pardon us for our shortcomings, to honor us with the ziyarah of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad in this life, and most importantly, to honor us with their shafa'a, their intercession on the day of judgment. And Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin